James chapter 5 tonight, James chapter 5. We're going to be hopefully getting through maybe the chapter in its entirety, but we'll get through a good portion of it tonight. And for those of you note takers uh, that are taking notes uh, for the message tonight, the title of the message is um, A Faith That Perseveres, A Faith That Perseveres. So James here in this section, closing out chapter four, James describes here a radically different way to live in this world. And particularly in the busyness and the busyness of our lives, this world tells us to live like we're going to be here forever. Now, James here is encouraging. He's He's reminding the believer what their purpose is as children of God in this world. The world urges us to make our plans and, and acquire possessions and, and build up our portfolios and live as if we're going to be here forever. But, but James just gives this simple directive. He says here, submit to God. Don't live like you're going to be here forever. Instead, live and plan and work your life in a sense as if the Lord can come back at any moment. Live it as if life is short and like you don't want to waste it on worldly things. In other words, you want to make the most of the time that God gives you and the greatest impact you can by advancing his kingdom and ministering to others. You know, one of the greatest joys that we get out of the Christian faith is when we lead people to Christ because we know that that's one more, that's one more that, that will make heaven their home. And so what James here encourages, and, and he's going to close with that, you know, make it your aim to, to be those who have sensitivity to the spiritual need of others. In other words, don't just live for yourself. And also, too, he's saying, live your life. We're going to see here in these next couple of verses. Live your life as, you know, humbly before the sovereignty of God, ultimately for the glory of God. And as the people of God, James here clearly is saying, we ought to make our lives the mist that comprises who you are for the short while that you're here. Because remember, in chapter 4, he says, you know, like, you know, your life is... Even as a vapor, verse 14 of chapter 4, the mist, the morning mist. He says, count this life under his sovereignty. So think about this. In other words, be finished with self-sufficiency in this life. And live your lives, I would like to add, radically dependent on the sovereignty of God. God is either in control or he's not. So... In chapter 4, in verse 17, notice what he says. And I want to start here because it's going to kind of lead us into this. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. James is saying here very clearly in this verse that, you know, for a person to know what to do, that which is good, and doesn't do that which is good, it's sin. So humility to the will of God means humble obedience to God. And that was the point that we ended with here, obedience to the will of God. So this is where James gives us a, a needed perspective on sin. And he's going to kind of, you know, look at this here. But, but think about this. He, he kind of lays it out this way. He, he talks about the sins of omission and sins of commission and he's kind of breaking it down here. Therefore, to him who knows, in other words, we are aware of what it is to do good and does not do it. So we disobey. To him, it is sin. Now, remember, we see elsewhere in Scripture where it says it's better for you to have not known than to know and not do and not obey and not, and not practice. So that reminder there. That if we have knowledge of what it is or what to do, that which is good, then because we are believers, we are to do it. To not do is sinful. You know, 
this is where oftentimes we tell people, you know, your silence is actually a response. Your silence is actually saying something. You know of a situation or a matter, and ultimately, you know, you, you, you can say something, and, and usually that's what it is. You know, people are always looking for somebody to say, say something. You know, but if you don't say it, and you know you should, your silence is, is your answer. In other words, because you're withholding and you're not saying, then it becomes that you're okay with what's being said. You know, in one, in one sense, like a lie. If you know that it's a lie, and maybe you're afraid of going and saying something because then what it'll do, it'll, it'll, it'll you know, bring you into the mix. You know, I don't want to get involved in that. But if you know that it's a lie, go and speak the truth regardless of what it will, it will do. But there's other things. Like if you know that you're called to meet the needs of others and the opportunity for you to meet the need is there. And, you know, James often refers to this contrast between the rich and the poor. And he's kind of challenging the rich to say, hey, listen, you know, if this is the status economically where your life is at, then then make it your aim with that for it to be a ministry, a ministry of wealth to as much as you can meet the need of those who, who, who don't have. And so, but if you have and you don't in the same way, it's sinful. So reviewing all of this here as he kind of lays this out because he's going to address this, you know, this picture here. Remember, he started off with not showing favoritism. And in some way, we can see here, consequently, it, it would be a sin of commission for us to show favoritism. But he also is telling them to care for the needy, to, to be a blessing to them. Um, he, he tells about those who boast about tomorrow. Don't boast like if, if you think or you're confident enough to think that, hey, listen, the sovereignty of God is not anything that you should submit yourself to. Because you are confident and you know that, that tomorrow is yours. No, it's promised to no one. And so this idea here is that we are to be aware of what God's called us to do and practice it as much as we are able to. And so like this example that he's given with the poor and the needy, he, he kind of lays it out this way and he says, well, there, it would be a sin of commission if we show favoritism, but also he told us to care for the needy. Therefore, it would be a sin of omission for us not to care for the needy. And this is, in fact, how Jesus approached the lack of care for the needy. Remember, Jesus had his way of, of, of speaking concerning those that were in need. In Matthew chapter 25, and we looked at this last time we were here, but, but the point that he's making is that Ultimately, this will show a life that is obedient to the will of God versus a life that is not. And it's not so much of the doing. It is if it is like second nature to you. So there's a lot of organizations today that, that give to the poor and they're not Christian organizations. And, and, and it's not that James is saying, nor is Jesus saying, hey, only Christians do this. No, people do this. But for the believer, it should be second nature. We should see it and be the first to meet the need. And we should do it because Jesus says to. That's it. Obedience to the will of God. And the Lord pays high dividends for obedience. So this kind of leads in, this challenge in verse 17, you know, he makes the seriousness of the sins of omission and commission very clear. So, in other words, what James is saying is, how can a person claim to be Christian but lives, you know, a lifestyle that's contrary to what the Bible says? Now, we're not talking about people making a mistake because, you know, I think on a day-to-day -day basis, we all kind of make these mistakes where we pray and we say, Lord, help me. You know, I'm, I'm blowing it here or there. What he's talking about are people that make it a, 
a normal practice of their life. So in other words, they're saying, hey, I love Jesus and I'm a man of God or I'm a woman of God, but, but they're choosing to live a sinful lifestyle. And we've all lived long enough in this fallen world that we've seen that, right? And so what James is really saying here, James is saying this shouldn't be spoken of for those who are truly submitted to the will of God and looking to the sovereignty of God, like the Lord is in control. So my life should be lived as if God is in control. My action should be seen as if the Lord is truly living in and through me. So we see here that how can one be this way? Well, it's simple. Constantly being in the word of God. Being in fellowship. Doing these things that are, that are maybe more easier to do than others. Maybe you might not have, like I was sharing with you guys here at the start of the service, the ability just to pick up and go to another state and, and go and plant a church in another country, you know. But you can serve those that have need in this community. You see, so you meet the need where it's at. And, you know, needs will always present themselves. It will always, they will always present themselves. So the emphasis really here is, in a sense, James kind of continues on this note of, listen, we need to take care of those who have need. And, and it could be for many things. It doesn't just have to be those that have um, material need. But it could also be those that have spiritual need. How many of us know an unbeliever? Well, we all do. Some of us have relatives that are unbelievers, right? But it's that too, meeting that spiritual need. That others need to know the Lord and, and make it your aim. Maybe, maybe uh, you know, if you're real, maybe, maybe we've ruined our testimony already, right? But you could still pray. You could still pray and, and fix that somehow, some way with them, especially if it's somebody that knows us, one of the easiest ways to fix it is repent and go and tell them you're sorry for misrepresenting Jesus. And the good thing about that is, you know, it's, it's a humiliating thing to do because of our pride, right? But, but that's what God works through. He works through humility. And the other thing is, is that they're going to know if you're really serious or not, especially if there are loved ones, right? They're going to know, they're going to watch, they're going to see. But you know what? That might be the thing that, that gets them. It might be the thing that they say, wow, I never thought they would do that. Because I've heard people say things like, you know, hey, they say they're Christian, but man, they're so proud. They're so prideful. Man, all of us have pride, right? All of us do. And, and um, if somebody tonight would say, oh, no, I'm humble. Yet yeah, you got pride. You're... <laughs> You just told on yourself, right? But, but we all do to some degree in some way. Remember what the Bible says, that God, what does he do? He resists the proud but gives what? More grace. Right? Verse 6 of chapter 4. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So here James is emphasizing leaving chapter for, and initially starting the, the, the book of James off with, you know, not showing partiality and ministering to those that are in need. Don't forget about them. Humble yourselves. Be a blessing. He's speaking to the church. Chapter 5, he doesn't start off with speaking to the church. As a matter of fact, what we see here is the tone at the end of chapter 4 here in verse 17. This tone here. He's carried, into, carried it into the next chapter, into a rebuke, a swift rebuke, but a rebuke not to the church, a rebuke to the rich. And James emphasizes the fact here, as we read a little bit further, that the judgment of God is coming. James says in verse 1, come now you rich. Notice he's not saying brethren, he's not saying brothers. Like in verse 3, look at how he starts uh, chapter 3 with in verse 1. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers. In, in chapter 5, you know, notice what he's saying here. Come now, you rich, and howl for your miseries are coming upon you. Now remember, he just said, therefore to him who knows to do good 
and does not do it, to him it is sin. This he's saying to the church, the body of Christ. But in the very next verse in chapter 5, he's speaking to unbelievers. And I want to highlight here in verses 1 through 7, what James is, I believe, uh, speaking on is that we, as believers, should be confident in the justice of God. And perhaps there's two reasons why he's doing this. One, because this letter was going to this letter was going to the churches. It's not like this letter was going to fall in the hands of unbelievers. So why would he address unbelievers in a letter that is addressed to the church? I believe for two reasons. Number one is to remind them that those who are not believers, that their riches are what they're living for. Maybe as, as a reminder and an encouragement to the church that this is how we are not to live. Don't be fooled. Don't be deceived. Don't get caught up in this stuff. But I believe the other side of it was too to encourage them that ultimately God's judgment is on its way. In other words, we might look at this and say, man, you know, we're here, we're here waiting on the Lord. And, and, and look at the world is just, you know, it's prospering. The rich are getting richer, right? And, and we kind of see that today in our world. There, there is a tendency for um, people in the church to be wowed and, and, and wooed, if you will, by riches and wealth. Position, prestige, security, especially, you know, in an economy like ours and in a state like ours where everything is through the roof. Like I could preach a whole sermon on how everything's expensive, right? And I'm sure that all of you guys can encourage one another on where to get the cheaper gas right now. By the way, it's the shell on Foothill before you get to Oleander. It's like 420 or something like that. Yeah, is that good? Okay, hooked you up, all right? So make sure you get me a gas card from there at Shell. Anyways, but I mean, you know, this is the kind of world we're living in. We're, we're looking for like the deals and the, you know, but it, it, and, and that's OK. You can do that. In other words, we do it because we want to be good stewards with what God gives us. Right. But the world, it, it seems like this. The rich are getting richer. It seems that when, you know, the rich get richer, the righteous suffer. And, and you know that this was an issue that, you know, the psalmist Asaph. He had in Psalm 73, he, he talked about this. He says, you know, there's a thing that I struggle with. And guys, this struggle happens in the heart of many people in the church. They get. And I want to maybe put it this way, they get tired or bored. Of waiting. For their day, waiting for their time, as if this is why we come to Christ, because we got something coming to us and, and, and we're going to no. listen, we've been forgiven. And what we have coming to us is eternity with Christ. And, and what James is encouraging the church to do, listen, he's saying we need to live with this anticipation. We need to be those who persevere even in times like this. Now, you know, I'll just kind of read a little I'll skim through this, you know, Psalm, because we can spend the rest of the night looking at Psalm 73. It's a it's an encouraging psalm, but, but it's also a reminder of this not only happening in our day, but, but this has happened, you know, in the psalmist day. Asaph was, you know, a, uh, of the priesthood, you know, he, he worked in, you know, around the tabernacle and acquainted with just, you know, the worship of the Lord God. And, 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 and here's what Asaph says. He says, truly God is good to Israel. In other words, there's there's no question that God is good to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. In other words, he's saying, listen, here's what we do know. We know that God is good. We say it right. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good, you know, kind of thing. But but what he's talking about here is the omnibenevolence of God. Truly, God is good. In what way and in what manner? Well, we look at Israel's past. We see there what the Lord has done, you know, in and through that, how he's delivered them, how he has worked with them, how he has strengthened them, how he has delivered them, how he's done these things for them. And, and, and this is what he does. Right. So so he's saying, truly, if we look back at the history of the people of Israel, God has been faithful. God is good. He says, but as for me, my feet have almost stumbled. In other words, I have wrestled with these things. I have 
I have, I have struggled perhaps with these things. And, and, and in what way? Notice what he says here. My steps had nearly slipped. In other words, I've, I've wrestled with these things. And he's going to explain what it is. For I was envious of the boastful. You ever had envy? Have you ever looked at others and said, why did they get that? Or why did they have that? Why, why, why is my life not as good as theirs? Or, or why is it that I seem like I'm always struggling and they, you know, are, are okay and they are, they are, you know, they're, they're happy. Or even as Christians, we sometimes will say things like, man, when I was, you know, when I was in the world, when I was, when I was, you know, I, I didn't have the problems that I have now. And I look at people that are not serving the Lord and how come, how come their marriages look more happy? You know, how come their kids look like they're good and they don't get in trouble? You know, so we can relate to a degree when, when we look at things like that, like, man, you know, right? But, but this is what he's saying. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. In other words, what Asaph is saying is the unrighteous, the unbeliever, the wicked does not deserve to prosper in this way. And that is true. But it doesn't mean they won't. For there are no pangs in their death. Notice what he's saying here. No pangs in their death. So, so the point that he's making here is he's saying, listen, it's not like, you know, it, it's not like they're suffering. Their health is good. And then he goes on to say here, but their strength is firm, the wicked. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. Look at that. They have more than heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression, the poor. Like, you know, they're poor because they don't work as hard or they don't have, you know. Th there is that. Re disregard toward those that have need. And, and notice what Asaph's saying here. The, the rich... Well, they persecute the poor. And that's what James was saying. Remember, he was saying the rich persecute the poor. And then he goes on to say here in Psalm 73, uh, in verse 8, he says, They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongues walk through the earth. In other words, they, they speak against the Lord as if their riches and their wealth can protect them and keep them. It, it seems like, man, they have it all. There's no worry. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongues. Like in other words, they're saying, I have all that I have because of who I am. Therefore, his people return here. The waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, how does God know? And is their knowledge in the most high? Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain. Wow. And washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been plagued. Notice what he says here. And chastened every morning. He, this hasn't been easy for Asaph. If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought of how to understand this, it was too painful for me. So notice what he's saying here. He's saying, listen, he says, I looked at this and I seen this and I realized the suffering. In other words, Asaph was wrestling with the fact that why does God's children suffer and the wicked seem to prosper? He says, this is an injustice. It's an injustice. But then he said something started to happen. As he began to experience these things, he, he realized something. In verse 14 and in verse 15, he says, For all the day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue in the generation of your children. Good thing he didn't speak. He's just pondering this in his heart. Good thing he didn't get out there and say, 
you know what? God's not going to deliver. God's not going to meet your need. God's not going to this. God's not going to that. And the next thing you know, you begin to see, you know, ultimately him stating very clearly here that, that you know, I, I, I'm, glad I, I'm glad I didn't say nothing. I'm glad I, I kept my mouth shut. But where did everything change? Verse 17, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. I understood their end. In other words, he's saying here, now I have understanding. Well, what took place in the sanctuary of God? The place where God's presence is. Prayer. The word of God. In other words, Asaph said, listen, we, we can be in this world, and if we are not doing what James says to do. Remember what James says to do. He makes it very clear. He says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. So in submitting to God, we come to the Lord in prayer. We come to the Lord through his word. We come through the Lord in fellowship. And Asaph was saying, listen, we live in such a lopsided world, if you will. The rich get richer. The poor, well, they get poorer. They suffer. As believers, he says, the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer. It's, 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 it's just this imbalance, he says, and it, and it ought not to be. And if I allow myself to ponder this in my mind and start to think of how unfair this is and allow the enemy to get in there and begin to kind of do that trick on my mind and make me think like, man, you know, this, this thing of trusting God when I have a need, well, where's God? He's not meeting the need. And you see the unrighteous, they don't have needs like you. And they're horribly wicked. And you say, how is it that, that they are better off than me? You know? But then he says, as I came into the sanctuary of the Lord, the place where God's presence is, the place where God's word and worship and prayer and these things, in other words, he submitted to God. And then what did he say? He says, good thing I didn't say anything because now I understand their end. I get it. He was able to resist. The temptation of doing what? Speaking against God. He was able to resist the temptation of perhaps maybe drawing a generation away from the Lord, you know, being taken in by the temptation of doing this. And how did he fulfill that? Submission to God. This is what perseverance is. To persevere means to, to really charge ahead, to do so even when... It's not easy. And in verses 1 through 7, James describes the world we live in. It's as if he's revisiting what, what Asaph is saying in Psalm 73, but, but he's giving this word directly to unbelievers, but more importantly, to the believer, that they would know and understand that they could have confidence in God's justice. So notice what Jesus says concerning the rich in Luke chapter 6. Look at what Jesus says, Luke chapter 6 in verse 24, Luke 6, 24. And Jesus kind of gives the same description here that James is giving in Luke chapter 6. I was looking at this earlier, and I should have put in my notes Luke chapter 6, verse 24 through 26. But look at what he says here. He says in verse 24, Luke chapter 6, But woe to you who are rich. This is Jesus. For you have received your consolation. And, and what does this mean? Jesus is not saying that riches are sinful. He's talking about, you know, those who are rich. And he's saying you have received your consolation. The idea there is when he's saying you've received your consolation, the implication is that they feel that they have all that they need. That they have all that they need. You know, some of the most... Difficult people to lead to Christ are those who feel they have everything they need. Some of us know people that are rich and wealthy and they don't really feel they need God, especially when things are going good, right? And they're making their money. Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. 
You know, Jesus' word here is he pronounces these woes. Jesus is also encouraging the disciples, you know, really, this is the world that we live in. That this is what others live for. So come now, you rich, and weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. In other words, judgment will come upon. Your riches are corrupted. Notice what he's saying here. The riches are corrupted. So he's not saying that they are corrupted in a sense, though riches will corrupt us. But, you know, this is the point. I think sometimes people think that if you're rich, you know, you're in sin. No, when you're when you're when your riches begin to take the place of, of the Lord in your life and you feel that you're good and you're at peace because of what you have. You know, resourcefully versus I'm good and I'm at peace because Christ has saved me. This is what. Timothy talks about there in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Look at what he says, and he kind of lays it out. This instruction to the rich, verse 17, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, to not to be proud, nor to trust in uncertain riches. Now, when you say uncertain riches, what does that mean? Well, you know, wealth doesn't last. It doesn't last forever. It might last for your lifetime, but you're going to expire. Right? And, and, and what does death do? It's, it's the great equalizer. M remember what Job said? He's like, naked I came into this world in, naked I will go. It, it's the great equalizer. So, so notice the point here that we see when he's saying here, uncertain. You know, you're not always going to be rich. And, and riches don't last. I mean, when, when the, you know, one of the things that we can take, at least in our lifetime, when the economy hit in 2008, I don't know if anybody here was affected by that, but, but the world's wealth was, I mean, at least for this country, and a lot of people lost, and it was out of their control. They couldn't stop it. They couldn't do anything about it. It was just like it was a loss. Everybody took it, and it wasn't that only a certain, everybody took a hit. And there's people that still say that. Now they're saying this after coming through and coming out of the, 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 the pandemic, right? They're saying, man, this business didn't recover. Churches didn't recover. Churches didn't open back up. And it, you, you look at these things and you say, wow, man, you know, wealth overnight. It's just it comes and it goes. Exactly. That's the uncertainty of riches. In other words, don't put your trust in riches because they come and go. So the idea here, he goes on to say in uh, chapter 6 of 1 Timothy, notice what else he says here. But trust not in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. And I think that is the point I'm wanting to make here. Are you okay with what God defines as he gives you richly all things you can enjoy. Are you okay with what God gives you? Now, this is that thing that I, that I was saying, you know, as James is speaking this word in chapter five, he's, he's kind of saying, are there any that wrestle? Man, I'd be better off if I had a little more. I believe it was Rockefeller, right? That they asked, you know, um, you know how much is enough? And his response was just a little more. Just a little more. I mean, that it's going to be, and, and when you hit that, how much is enough? A little more, a little more, a little more, you see? And, and so the point here, for the child of God, it's not will you or you should be okay. Let them do good that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. Storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold of eternal life. This is very consistent with what Jesus says, right? Store up for yourselves treasures where? In heaven. That's exactly what Paul is saying to Timothy there. He's kind of laying that out in verse you know, 18 there as he kind of just kind of sums that all up. He says, listen, there's eternal things that we're living for. And the reality is, and you guys have been hearing me say this on Sunday morning, but the reality is, is the wealth and the riches of this life, they, they don't translate into eternity. Remember when Jesus was 
in the temple area with his disciples and they saw all the rich coming and giving the religious leaders and then the widow comes in, right? The story of the widow's might, right? And Jesus then kind of pulls his disciples aside and he teaches them a very valuable lesson. So the rich are going and they're all giving, right? And, and then here comes the widow and she gives just, she gives pretty much all that she has. And that doesn't mean that God wants, you know, everything that you have. He's not going to pick you up by your ankles, flip you upside down and, you know, shake you and take, I want it all. No, listen, the, 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 the reality of the story was, I think the principle was the currency that she paid with. It wasn't so much that she didn't have the currency of the day, but her currency was different. It wasn't currency from another country. It wasn't currency that, that you know, was outdated or, or she didn't pay in any other way. The currency that she paid was with the currency of heaven. Because she gave in faith. And that's why Jesus said to his disciples, she gave more than these all. He didn't say she gave more than him or him. No, she, he said she gave more than these all. And, and the disciples are scratching their head. How can this widow who just gave two mites give more than everybody here? Because she paid with the currency of heaven. She trusted God. There's, a, there's an important thing to learn in that. And that's what I believe Paul is saying to Timothy as he sums that up there in chapter 6 in those couple of verses. He's saying here very clearly, listen, this is how one is to live. We live for the Lord. We live for eternal things. Now, now if, if God has blessed you beyond measure, be a good steward. Be a good steward. Stewardship is trusting the Lord. Part of that is giving. Giving. I shared with you guys, I knew a gentleman, he's, he's now gone to be with the Lord for a couple of years, and some of you that have been here long enough, uh, you know, know this uh, gentleman, because he was a blessing to this church. Uh, you know, this man was a multimillionaire. And he brought me into his family, treated me like one of his kids, and I, you know, and I would go to family functions, and there I am, you know, the Mexican, you know, and he would tell his sons, I, he says, I love David like my son. And this man was in his 80s, and this guy poured into me. And, you know, he was, a, he was just a great, great man. You know, and I never seen somebody give. I, I never seen somebody give so much money away. And I'll never forget, you know, we, we were there in his living room. We were having a meeting, and... You know, somebody comes in and they sit there and they start talking about a need and he's looking at them. And I used to always just trip out on him, how he would just listen. He'd just stare with these piercing eyes listening. And, and a lot of times he would tell me, David, just he'd go like this. Go, go, go fix it. Go, go fix it. You know, kind of thing. Like nothing was a worry or a bother to him. You know, and um, I'll never forget. I, I just seen him, you know, he just wrote this check. And instead of handing it to the guy, he kind of, you know, Passed it around, you know, and he says, you know, the reason why I want these men to touch it is because these are men of faith and men of prayer. And I just want their blessing. And, and, and I, you know, the other guys were very spiritual. I wasn't. I looked at the check. I wanted to see how much it was for. <laughs> it was for a lot. A couple of hundred thousand. And I remember when he gave it to him after it was all said and done, you know, I was I was eating up all the coffee cake that his wife made homemade by the way and we're sitting there in front of the fire and and uh you know i think at the time he was like 82 years old 83 and look at him and i says how do you do that without hesitation and he starts laughing and he says what write a check i says yeah you know i go i get it you know like you got you got you know you're you're a rich man i says you know but he's all it's not about that he goes actually i'm not he goes, I don't, I don't, he goes, that check that I just wrote just came in. And the Lord just told me to give it to him. And he says, one thing David learned, you will never be able to outgive God. He goes, and maybe tomorrow a check will come in and I'll probably hold it in my account for a day or two until the Lord says, now give it to this one, give it to that one. He goes, my whole life's been that way, but I've never been without. 
My family's blessed. My children are blessed. My grandchildren are blessed. And I was blown away by that, you know? So I was like, well, you know, I got needs, bro. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Trust me, that man took care of me. He really did. He was a blessing to my life more than anything. I just liked hanging out with him. It was just, we, we just had some good conversations. And we'd, we'd cry together. We'd pray together. And he was really blessing to my life. But, but that's the whole point. Like, I can say I knew someone that riches didn't mean anything to him. What he saw in riches was more opportunity to serve the body of Christ. More opportunity to serve the body of Christ. It's mind-blowing. You know, and, and we would go to places, and, and, and he'd say, I want you to meet me here, and I'd go to this place, and it'd be like a, like a senior community, but not like the ones here in Fontana. Like, this one was like, like, on like, like golf course property. I mean, beautiful houses, everything. And then I says, oh, man, this is nice. Are you planning to move here, you know? Like, I didn't know. He's like, no, I own it. He's like, there's a couple of empty houses. You can come and stay here if you want, you know, for a time and get away for a weekend or something, you know, and do stuff here with your church. Bring them here for a banquet. Come do it in my living room. His living room was the size of our sanctuary, I mean, a little bit bigger. But, you know, and I was like, man, this guy is amazing, you know. And when he went to be with the Lord, I'll never forget at his funeral, his son got up there. And you, you couldn't have a funeral for this man without talking about money. This guy was the biggest giver anybody ever met. And, 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 and his son asked, how many of you here were blessed by my father in the area of giving? That he blessed you financially. There was probably about, I'm not exaggerating, maybe six, seven hundred people there. I don't think there was one that did not raise their hand. All the people raised their hand like we, we all have. It's like, wow. You know, but God, he does that. And, and I share that story because I always think of him when I think of, you know, the scripture's encouragement not to love money. This man had it and did not love it. He loved God more than anything. He loved the Lord. So here, this word and this rebuke is, in a sense, to even remind us not to, not to come undone. Not to think that, you know, man, you know, I'm really missing out here. I'm, I'm, I'm missing out. You know, there's, there's something else out there for me. And I, if, if, if I just go and get it, then I'll be happy. No, remain. Persevering is where you need to be. Remain. Now, look at what he goes on to say here. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. In other words, it's all subject to decay. It doesn't last forever. We quoted Jesus, you know, in Matthew chapter 6. What did he say in verses 19 through 21? Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. He says your gold and your silver are corroded. Now, we know that gold does not corrode. But the point that he's making is he's saying here, it's subject to decay. And their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. And you have heaped up treasures in the last days. So the point here that he's making here that the riches are corrupted, meaning, in other words, they're prostituting their, their goods, their, their wealth, their God-given, if you will, wealth. See, the rich don't understand that, that all that we have in this life and in this world is because God allows it. They might say, well, God didn't give me my wealth, but he sure gave you the breath that's in your lungs every day to wake up. You woke up on the, on the wake-up list this morning. It all starts there. But notice here, they forget that the Lord is, as the psalmist said in Psalm 73, he says, truly the Lord is, the Lord God is good. We know that. The world doesn't know that, right? The world doesn't see that. So he goes on to say here, he says, you have heaped up treasures in the last days. In other words, they're living for this. Remember in 2 Timothy, in chapter 4, Paul says, you know, those, those wicked people that stray from the faith will heap up for themselves teachers. They will, they will amass them. In other words, they will only want to get around those that, that will speak what they want to hear. Here he's saying, listen, they, they heap up for themselves treasures in the last days as if Christ is not coming back. We're going to be here forever. 
And, and what do they do? Well, they ultimately, in doing so, James will argue that they do so at the expense of the poor and the needy, no desire to minister. So notice what he says here in verse 4. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of of the Lord of hosts. The, the, the word there is Seboth in your Bibles. It's really the Lord of hosts. And so what is he saying here? He's saying those that receive this wealth in some ways have done it by defrauding others. Because a lot of the riches, I mean, this is where it is. I mean, today we, it's kind of become like this political thing, right? And we're seeing that a lot of the political argument right now, especially with, you know, time of the elections coming, a lot of it is talking about Wealth that's been received by ill-gotten gain by these political figures. Now, we know that political figures are not, you know, those that we're to be looking for as the answer, but we're seeing it where we see that, that all of this wealth has been in some way brought in somehow, some way, you know, at the expense of others. And he says here, in this case, he says, Remember, in Leviticus 19 and in Deuteronomy 24, the Bible says, do not defraud your brother in this way. You give them what, what you owe them. But the riches of the world are always received. Worldly will be received by ill-gotten gain. And he says in verse 5, you have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. How? by hoarding up their wealth, hoarding up their, their riches, by, by fraud, by, by self-indulgence. And he's reminding them in verse 4 to the unrighteous that defraud, that don't meet the need, that are not sensitive to the need. He says this, listen, the cries of those who have been defrauded, the cries of those who have been abused and neglected and all that, listen, their prayers, their cries have reached the ears of the Lord God. And what does God do to that? Well, remember, we've been in the book of the prophet Ezekiel on Sunday nights. And, and remember the issue with the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. What did, what did the Bible say that the Lord destroyed the city of Sodom and Gomorrah? Chapter 16. Remember what, what he says here. The, here's the issue with Sodom and Gomorrah. The people of Sodom and Gomorrah took advantage. Notice what it says in verse 49 of chapter 16. It says, or I'll start in verse 48. As I live, says the Lord God, neither your sister Sodom nor her daughters have done as you have your daughters have done. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. Notice that. Fool of food, but there was an abundance of idleness. Meaning what? They had the resources to help those in need, and they chose not to. So we always think of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah to some sense, well, you know, they were living in sin, and they were uh, sexually perverse people, but no, Ezekiel prophesies, and he says, that was part of it, but the other part of it was that, you know, they, 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 they lived for self-indulgence. They had wealth and they had riches and they had resources and they had these things. But ultimately what they did was they they chose to keep them and never met the need. And so ultimately, though there was none righteous, remember Abraham prayed as he prayed for the destruction of the city. Remember what he told the Lord, if you find, you know, uh, 50 righteous and he went all the way down to 10. You know, the Lord says, if I find 10, you know, but there was none righteous. There was none righteous. Ultimately, you might say, well, if there was none righteous, then why did God hear the prayers? Well, we serve a just God. We serve a just God. And when there's injustice is done, then the Lord's justice will prevail at some point in time. And so judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah was responding to the cries of the poor and the needy. Remember, he says, their cries have come up to me. Especially when he was explaining, should I share with Abraham what I'm about to do? And then he begins to say, the cries of the people have come up to my ears. I've heard their cry and I'm going to respond. So that had to do with that, the neglect of the poor and the needy. So translating this now here with James, James is saying it still stands. This is how the Lord still operates today. In verse six, he says, you have condemned and you have murdered. 
That's interesting. You have condemned and you have murdered. According to Jewish thought, listen to this. When you do not give to the poor and the needy, when you do not give of what you have to meet the need of your brethren, it's equal to murder. It's equal to murder. These are Jewish believers. So they understand very clearly what James is saying here. You have condemned and you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. Notice that. The Lord will deal with it. God does not resist you. You will be dealt with. Now look at chapter 2 and verse 6. Notice what he says, James, chapter 2, verse 6. But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? James is saying here, the rich persecute the poor. And one day, all of these injustices done by a filthy rich world. Let me say that again, by a filthy rich world. We think of filthy rich like, oh, they just got a lot. But I'm talking about riches acquired by filth. When that happens, all the injustices, it'll take place. The Lord will met out justice. So notice here in verse 7. Therefore, be patient. I love that. So now we look at verses 1 through 6 and we say, now he's speaking to the church. In verses 1 through 6, he wasn't speaking to the church. He was speaking to the rich that were corrupted in their riches, that were not doing what they should be doing with those riches. In other words, you know, meeting the need and being a blessing and and so on and so forth. They were living for their riches, living as if Christ was not coming, living as if, listen to this, guys, as if there's no eternity. Because that's true. The rich who live for the riches of this world do not believe that they need God in their life. You know, I was listening to a, I think it was a real and the real word was some of the words that of, of Steve Jobs. You know, the, the, everybody knows who Steve Jobs is, right? And, and um, you know, one of the wealthiest men in the world, you know, and he died a, uh, you know, a billionaire. And, you know, and uh, we know all Apple product, everything. But, you know, he died. And ultimately, his last words were something to the nature of while he was dying was like, man, it doesn't matter how much money you have in this world. Doesn't matter what you've created. Doesn't matter, you know, the industrious, you know, evolution of things and all these things. Like he just laid it all out, kind of like his life. He says, all that doesn't matter because none of that can help me. Like I'm dying. Like this is it. So I have all of this for what? Now, my prayer would be that this man knew Jesus as Lord and Savior because you know, if not, that's a very sad end. To realize then, to hear those words, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. But yet in this life, he had it all. He had everything. And he got to the point where he realized that all of his riches, listen to this, could not help his physical body anymore. His billions could not help him live a day longer. All gone. You see, in all this here, don't be distracted by the riches of the world. Don't be, don't be put off. Don't be distracted. Don't, don't start thinking, well, you know, you know, I just, I just, maybe if I just cut some corners here and do some things there. Guys, listen, be, be above reproach. And also, don't live like if, like if this next dollar is going gonna, is gonna to make you any better than what you are. Put God first. Put the things of the Lord first. Trust God. And, and this other thing that we sometimes wrestle with, like Asaph said, hey, he, he didn't wrestle with riches. He wrestled with the fact that why do the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer? Right? But there are people that actually wrestle with this here. This, this is a problem for them. For the believer now, as he's speaking to this, take note that in verses 1 through 6, he's saying, listen, like Asaph is saying, you know, the wicked are prospering. James is saying, well, the wicked, they're going to be dealt with by God. God will judge the wicked. He will judge them. Therefore, you be patient. 
brethren, notice how he says brethren now, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. I love this here. So to be patient means really the capacity to accept or to tolerate suffering without getting angry or upset. To be patient here, he says, is to, is to accept and to tolerate. Notice that. Suffering without getting angry or upset. Waiting on the Lord. Why? Because just like the Lord is coming to judge those that are corrupt, the Lord is also coming to deliver those who patiently wait. So the deliverance of the Lord is on its way. Trusting God with, you know, with everything. And especially trusting God, you know, with what you cannot control. This is what the farmer did. See, the farmer had no control of the early rain or the latter rain. If there was too much rain, it would ruin his crops. If there was not enough rain, it would be a drought and his crops were ruined. So the, so, so the farmer was, you know, he didn't have this irrigation system to do this. I mean, he waited for God's irrigation system and he trusted the Lord for those things that were out of his control. If, I, if, if we get a short amount of rain, well, then you know what? We're, our crops are going to suffer if we get too much. You know? So in other words, the things that were out of his control, the farmer here trusted the Lord. There are things that are going to be out of your control. And in other words, don't lose heart and don't give up. And don't go the way of trying to pursue these things like, listen, if it's not going to happen, I got to go make it happen. No, James is saying, be patient. We're going to experience some things in this life. But like the farmer that waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the earlier latter rain, you also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. I love that. So you trust God with what you cannot control, but honor God with what you can control. And you know what you can control? Being patient. Trusting the Lord. You can't control the, the, the difficulties of this life. They're going to come. All of us are going to get hit by it. Sometimes it's one thing after another, isn't it? I mean, it, it really is. And, I, and I've had that in my life as, as a Christian. I'll be honest with you guys. I've had, at times, you know, things are going good, and then, boom, something happens, and then it gets worse. And I'm just like, man, then it gets worse. It's like, man, I don't have, you know, an opportunity to come up for some, for some air. But, you know, I realize in that moment, Lord, you're God. And I've trusted you all these years, and Lord... This is just how I do it within the reasoning in my heart. Lord, you seen this coming before it even came. You seen it coming in my In other words, Lord, you seen this in in my life at this point in time and you're going and you know the outcome. You you're already seeing how this is going to end. So what I need to do is I just need to trust you. Because a lot of this is outside of my control. And anyways, the Bible doesn't tell me to be in control. It says to rest in the sovereignty of God and his complete control and rest in. And, 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 but you want to know what? My flesh is challenged with that at times. It's like, oh, man, I don't know if God's going to come through. I mean, I don't say that, but I think that. And it's like, man, Lord, but you will. You are. You're faithful, you know. And, and sometimes, you know, sometimes I wake up. It'll be two, three in the morning. You know, I, I don't really have no other reason to be up at all whatsoever. I mean, I could sound spiritual and say, oh, yes, you know, I just go and get in the word and I pray for you guys, you know. No, you know, I, but I do. I, if I get up that early, I realize, walking with the Lord this long, I realize it, it's not just by coincidence. Like, you know, maybe it's a good time to pray for some people. Whether it be myself and my family, my kids, you know, my wife. Uh, sometimes it's, it's something that maybe is on my heart because something one of you guys are going through. You know, and it's just like, you know, Lord, I pray for them. And, you know, it's not anything extravagant or great, but the fact that I just say, Lord, you know, meet the need. God, you know. Because I, I hope that somebody's doing the same for me. I believe they are because I can feel that people are praying for me. And so when people tell me, you know, like, man, I'm praying for you, bro. 
I don't get offended when people text me out of the blue or they come up to me and say, you know what, I'm just praying for you. Like other people do, like, why? What, what, what did you hear? Like, dude, we all need prayer, man, right? Like, I'm praying for you. You know, I, to me, I appreciate that. I'm like, thank you. I need it. I need it. And I also need to be praying for others. Let me say that again. Thank you, I need it, but I also need to be praying for others. And, and you know, it's not a funny thing, and it's not a bad thing, but I'm just saying, when I get up and I'm like that, you know, sometimes I'll get up and I'll even make coffee and I'll drink it and I'll read, and then I'll go back down and fall asleep again. It's like, go to bed, you know, kind of thing, a couple hours, whatever. But sometimes I just pray. I don't get out of bed or anything like that. I'll just pray, and before you know it, I'm back asleep again. So is it prayer that puts me back to sleep? <laughs> Probably not. But ultimately, I would say the time that you have, don't waste it. The time that you have, don't waste it. You know, this whole point here of being patient, I think a lot of times we miss the point with this. And what the Lord is saying here is that, really, guys, the truth is we have no reason to complain. Has God ever been off with you? Has he ever missed it with you? Has he ever not been good to you? So patience should be that opportunity for us to experience the goodness of God. Now, I would like to say, who wants patience here? Raise your hand so we can pray. But, I, you know, I mean, you could pray for that. But n note that now that you're aware that you're praying for patience, the implication is that you are impatient. We all are, right? But you're going to start to see some things now happening. You're going to be like, whoa. Why is this happening? What well, you did pray for patience. So here's an opportunity to practice it. Do not, he says here, verse 9, grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Wow. You see this word here, grumble? What James is saying here is, not only submit to God, resist the devil. He says, resist complaining. Re resist speaking any evil against one another. Remember that the true judge is coming. Acts chapter 22 and verse 14 says that a day is going to come when the just one will come. Be careful. You see... Verses 1 through 6, I'm just giving you my point, could be that very thing. In other words, like, hey, you know what? You know, don't, don't lose patience. Don't, don't go and try to make it happen. Trust the Lord. But then he also says there's other things that happen too when we're not patient. We can go the way of the people of the world in that way and think that those things are going to help and I've seen it. It's sad when I see people think like, oh, you know, you don't understand. I got to go get this money. I got to get this money. There's things I want in this life, and I ain't going to get And I've heard people tell me that even here at the church, faithful, serving the Lord, coming to all services, seeing the Lord do a work in their life. And then over a period of time, they just kind of like, you know, I just got to go. I'm, I'm tired of suffering. I got to go. There's an opportunity for me. And, and you know what? And, and they walk away from Nearness to God. Nearness to God. Remember what Luke chapter 12 in verses 13 through 21, it says this, someone from the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the in inheritance with me. Friend, he said to him, who appointed me judge or arbitrator over you? Then he told them, watch out and be on guard against all greed because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. Then he told them a parable, a rich, man, a rich man's land was very productive. 
And he thought of himself, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? I'll do this. He said, I'll tear down my barns and build a bigger one and store all my grain and my goods there. Then I will say to myself, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy, eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life is demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? That's how it is with the ones who stores up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. The encouragement there is to be rich toward God. Well, one of the ways of being rich in the Lord is patiently waiting on the Lord. What am I going to get out of just sitting around waiting? It's not what James is saying. He's saying be patient. In other words, patient in suffering. God pays high dividends as stated earlier for those who trust in the Lord. And look at what he goes on to say here. Do not grumble against one another because this could be the case too where we start to complain. We start to complain. We start to grumble. We start to speak evil of one another. In verse 10, he says, My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Because sometimes there is that. There's complaining. And, and this also, you know, most commentators agree and have commented on this. The grumbling against one another is not only that, like, you know, perhaps maybe looking at someone else and saying, well, why do they get to and why this and why do they have and all of that and or why don't I have but it also could be as well as speaking evil against one another. The Bible says to resist this. Keep in mind that the enemy would love to destroy unity in the church. And what is destructive to unity in the church is words against others in the church. And, and it might be something as simple as, you know, giving your opinion. And as I stated earlier, a person's silence, it, it, it could be damaging when things have been said and things have been done. But, but the point here, too, speaking evil of one another. You know, the sad reality is that, you know, sometimes you have people that will come and share things with you that were probably shared with them in confidence. And the sad reality is that, you know, it might be something that maybe was directed toward you. Maybe directed toward something or someone that involved you. But they were told it in confidence, maybe through a prayer request. And, you know, hey, I know they said this. How do you know? Because they came to me for prayer about it. It's happened here in this church. And, 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 the, and, and the things that have been said with that, the, the individuals involved, they don't have a relationship. But the one that went and said it, oh, they're fine. The Lord will deal with that. And the Lord will deal with you if you remain to be in relationships with people that divide the body of Christ. I know sometimes people like to sound spiritual and say, oh, you know, I'm just... No, we don't, I, don't, I don't do any of that. I don't, listen, you do if you're not saying anything. You do if you're not standing up for what creates unity in the body. And here this warning is, he says, resist, resist grumbling against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. You know, James here is not pulling any punches. He's saying there are things that we can easily be distracted with. One of it is the way of the world. I mean, what did, what did Paul say about, you know, Demas? What did he say about those that had went away? And, and John and, and, and Paul the Apostle. They're the two that mentioned those that have, that have left for a love for the world. But even more so, we see those that struggle with that. But even within the body, those that struggle with this. This is, this is just as bad. Indeed, we count them blessed who endured. Have you not heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful? 
Job endured. See, what, what people are afraid of is this. Here, here's what people are afraid of. They would rather grumble against one another because they don't want to lose the ears that they have. They're afraid to speak up for unity in the church and say, you know what, that's not right. And I don't want nothing to do with that. And to have nothing to do with that means that I can't have nothing to do with you until you truly repent of what you did. Because this is, this is an attack against the body of Christ. The problem is, is that the body of Christ is not as important to us. That's something that we will also give an account for. James is saying here very clearly, listen, as servants of the Lord, we're going to suffer. But don't come undone. Even when those, like Job, listen, his, his best friends, boy, <laughs> you look in the book of Job, right? And, and you look at the close of uh, chapter 42, I mean, you read the whole book and you're like, man, how much can a man take, right? But, but what was bad was Eliphaz, the Tamanite, Bildad, the Shuite, and Zophar, the Namathite. These guys, when they spoke to Job, they said, Job, you're suffering because there's sin, unconfessed sin in your life. I mean, they were supposed to be like the guys that comfort him, like these are the guys that came. And what were they doing? They were accusing him. Why? Because they didn't understand what God was doing. And the Lord rebukes them. Job calls them miserable comforters, right, or counselors. But then the Lord rebukes them, and the Lord says to them, listen, he says in verse 7 of chapter 42, and so it was after the Lord had spoken these words to Job that the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, my wrath is aroused against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. And what were those three guys doing? They were, they were trying to get Job to do what Job's wife wanted him to do, right? She says, curse God and die. And Job couldn't do it. And you read the remainder of chapter 42, and what happened? Well, his miserable comforters and counselors, they get rebuked, but the Lord blesses Job beyond measure. And you know what Job repented of? I love this here. Job, Job didn't have to repent of saying, God, you're this, you're that. No, he didn't. As much as you know, his friends and his wife would have loved him to do, if some way that would have changed the situation. No, but here's what Job repents of. Look at verses 5 and 6 of chapter 42 of the book of Job. He says, I have heard you by the hearing of the ear, but now my, eyes, now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. What did he repent of? What, what did he ab abhor? Well, the very fact that he thought that his suffering was, was unjust. Like in other words, as far as Job got was like, I didn't deserve this. And that's what he's apologizing for. That Lord, I even thought that, that I was undeserving. As in other words, I should understand and know, at least I'll speak on this part here, that suffering is part of the life of those who are in you. And to think that I shouldn't have to suffer, we all will. And what does the Lord do? The Lord blesses him. You know, guys, if there's ever a time where people are more distracted in their walk, more than anything, and, and even those that are faithful, it's now. I do see in the church, this is what I do see, People losing heart and nobody having patience and wanting to persevere. But you know what? That's what the Bible says these days are going to come like. Jesus told the Jews, he says, listen to the Jews. He spoke to them and he says, listen, in these days, you will be deceived. And today there is great deception. And it's happening. But we have to learn what it is to be patient. Like the farmer, we say, you want to know what? Listen, okay, I might not have everything because we do live in a very materialistic world, don't we? But notice what he's saying here. He's saying, listen, God's going to come deliver the faithful. It's not always going to be this way. So what we need to learn is to be patient in suffering and look at Job as an example. Like the farmer who's trusting God with the things that are out of his control and honoring God with the things that are in his control. And that's what we need to be doing. And, and, and in the process of that, he says, listen, take your eyes off of others. Don't grumble against one another, your brethren. 
lest you be condemned. You see, the judge is coming. The Lord will come and he will deal with all of this. We might be tempted to complain and speak evil against one another, but we must resist. Remember, the judge is coming. Acts chapter 22 and verse 14. And we want to be found faithful. Amen. Don't you guys want to be found faithful? I do. We're to be patient like the prophets who suffered and were patient in speaking the truth, even when the, the, the people of Israel didn't want to hear the truth. And we also need to have patience like Job. Hoping in God's purpose. Hoping. Remember that. Job says, I've heard, but now my eyes have seen. He says, Lord, I repent. Father, I pray.